The Everyday Hatred of Men Part 3. Hegemonic Masculinity We've looked at patriarchy theory and toxic masculinity, and now we'll have a look at the third rail of this man-hating triangle, hegemonic masculinity. All three of these prejudge men as a birth group in a negative manner. This is forbidden for any other group. Imagine the outrage if people assumed a negative trait simply due to being born black or female. This would be seen as highly bigoted, but with men, prejudice is accepted as fact. The elements of patriarchy, toxic masculinity, and hegemonic masculinity all prejudge males, and this is blatant sexism. In some cases where white males are singled out and prejudged, the bigotry is doubled to be both sexist and racist, and guess what? Nobody blinks. So how did hegemonic masculinity get started? Well, R.W. Connell started writing about hegemonic masculinity in the 1980s, and then in 1995 published a book titled Masculinities. The word hegemonic basically means control, and Connell's descriptions of masculinity focused on men's desire to control. One writer said that Connell described hegemonic masculinity as a social process in which one form of institutionalized masculinity is culturally exalted above all others. Hmm. That exalted form for Connell is one in which hegemonic masculinity seeks power over women, is violent, sexually unrestrained, and disdains homosexuals. The theory claims this is the driving model for men to seek to emulate. So Connell's pretty slick. He doesn't say men are toxic. He says masculinity is the villain that pushes men to be toxic. Different path, same outcome. Men are toxic. Connell's book became the most cited academic book on masculinities. It was a big hit. I wonder if a part of its acceptance in academia wasn't due to Connell's framing hegemonic masculinity as being an integral part of patriarchy. Connell, Connell tied his theory to the ideas of patriarchy, and since patriarchy was a hot and politically correct idea in academia, this must have greased the wheel for his psychological theory to get rave reviews. Men bad, women victims. Yep, that works in academia. In a very difficult-to-believe twist, Connell had a sex change in 2005 and went from male to female. Now known as Ray Wynn Connell, the one who wrote the book on masculinity is the one who saw men and masculinities in such negative light found it necessary to leave being a man and to become a woman. I'll let you ponder what that might mean about Connell's views on men. Hegemonic masculinity is obviously a misandrist theory, but it couldn't get very far without popular academic support. How could such hateful generalizations about men and masculinity make it into the academy and its research? Enter the academic white knights. Let's look at just one in order to understand how this hateful theory could be supported. Let's have a look at the CMNI and how it pushed the agenda of hegemonic masculinity without a shred of hard data. The CMNI is an abbreviation for the Conformity to Masculine Norms Inventory. It seeks to map out the cultural gender norms that influence the behaviors of men. It turns out the researcher, a man named Mahalik, arbitrarily inserted some of Connell's ideas into his inventory as being masculine norms. Have a look at this chart of the history of masculine norms in psychological research. Notice that up until 2003, most of the masculine norms were things like independent, level-headed, tough, strong, risk-taker, leader, etc. But the advent of Mahalik's inventory in 2003, four new roles for men come out of nowhere. Here they are. Violence, power over women, disdain for homosexuals, and playboy. Hmm, sounds like Connell's playbook, doesn't it? When I first read this inventory, I was shocked. Where did those four come from as masculine norms? So I wrote to Mahalik and asked that question. He wrote me back and suggested I read two journal articles that he had attached. I read them, couldn't find any connection to those with the four new norms. I think he did this as a dodge, with the idea that I would never read the two articles, but nope, screw that, I read them. So I wrote him back and told him the two articles didn't seem to address why those four norms were in the inventory. It took him a while, but he did get back to me, this time with a suggestion I read a book to get the answer. 
Turns out the book he suggested was out of print and was more than 15 years old. Same dodging tactic. I did just what he didn't expect. I found the book. I was then amazed at what I found. Keep in mind that this book was supposed to be the research that he cited to include the Playboy norm. I discovered that Playboy was indeed one of the roles the book mentioned. It was one of the four roles under the category of men's ways of loving. The other three in that category were breadwinner, faithful husband, and nurturer. Each of those sounded complimentary, as opposed to Playboy, which seemed a little bit more judgmental. As I went through the book, I found that the book's author stated that the Playboy role was only chosen by 1% of the men surveyed as their dominant role. Whoa! This leaves us with the obvious question of why Mahalik would choose Playboy as a norm when the source he claims to have used to find those norms listed Playboy as a very infrequent choice for men. It just didn't add up. It obviously increased my doubts about the other norms he added. It seemed to me that this researcher was willing to abandon scientific method in order to get these norms into his inventory. It looked like he just stuck it in there without any hard data, showing Playboy to be a masculine role. Well, there's a great deal more fishiness in this inventory. One twist you don't realize immediately until you read it thoroughly is that Mahalik's idea about masculine norms doesn't apply to all men. They only apply to middle and upper class white males. He doesn't display this prominently, and I'm guessing that uh, most simply don't realize it, but that's just what he did. If that's not weird enough, just look at the focus groups he used to determine the masculine norms. He pulled together focus groups to discuss and refine these norms. But wait, women outnumbered men in these groups, even though the groups were about masculine norms. Even worse, only one third of the members of the focus groups were white males. Hi, hi, hi. The very group they were supposed to be about were a minority. Now you can compare this to the, his later work on the female version, the CFNI, where the focus groups were um, all female. There's more, and if you want to read the entire story, I'll leave a link in the upper right. I was confused about the source of these norms. At this point, I was unaware of Connell's theory, and later, once I was familiar with Connell, it seemed clear to me that Mahalik pulled those norms directly from Connell and had just stuck them into the inventory without any research to back them up and propped up by a predominantly female focus group. Absolutely and totally bizarre. But nearly as bizarre were the discussions I had with psychological professions on the APA Division 51 mailing list. This is a group sponsored by the American Psychological Association that studies men and masculinity. They're supposed to be the top psychological people in the APA studying men and masculinity. I brought up the Mahalik research on the mailing list, and they were completely supportive towards Mahalik. Turns out he was friends with many of the members, and my criticisms of his research were ignored, as were his questionable methods. Yes, this is the feminist version of the good old boy network. For those of you who don't know the story, I was later ejected from this group, and if you want the whole story, you can check in the upper right also. Just to give you a sense of the not denial in this group, let me show you the list of Mahalik's masculine norms. The four that he added were pretty rough on men and seemed to address a tiny fraction of males. But wait, he later wrote a second inventory for women, the CFNI, Conformity to Feminine Norms Inventory. I was thinking that maybe he'd be similarly tough on women. List things like gossip, mean girls, relational violence, you know, the stuff of recent research. But nope, here's the list of feminine norms. Nice in relationship, thinness, modesty, domestic, care for children, romantic relationship, sexual fidelity, investment in appearance. All sweet and nice. When I brought this to the attention of the Division 51 mailing list, they insisted the two lists were equally hard on women as they were on men. Gracious. Both Connell and Division 51 sing the song that they blame masculinity and not men. They attack masculinity with a passion and claim this is not attacking men. I remember writing to the list that it might be likened to covering a man with plastic wrap. Labeling the plastic wrap as masculinity and then beating the plastic wrap with a hammer. Yes, you're attacking the plastic wrap, which is separate from the man, but no, the man on the other side of the attack is hurt in the process. You don't see any of them attacking femininity, do you? Probably not. 
Both Mahalik and Connell's ideas seem to be one-sided, the negative side. Connell is specifically void of any explanation for the goodness or generativity of men. His only focus is the negative, the Mobius strip of psychological theories. If you go to his book on Amazon and type into the search inside this book box, you'll get the picture of its one-sided nature. Type in things that men have done for centuries, like sacrifice, kindness, maturity, loving. What you find is these words are not even mentioned in the book. Hmm. Compare the work of Connell and Mahalik with psychologist Robert Moore's developmental theories of the mature masculine. Moore takes a much more balanced look at men's development, both the good and the bad. Connell is as one-sided as a Mobius strip. I'm happy to report that Connell's theory has gotten a great deal of criticism. Not as much as I think it deserves, but at least people are questioning it. On a positive note, there's a newer theory called inclusive masculinity that proposes that men and boys can have a positive side and not be wedded to violence, misogyny, or homophobia. Progress. What a concept. The next and final video in this series will have a look at the reasons behind the everyday hatred of men. If you like this sort of video, please consider supporting this channel via Patreon or a one-time donation. And let's keep in mind, men are good as are you. Please like, subscribe, comment as you see fit.